Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Devedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different properties of the enzyme in the course Enzyme Science and Technology. So, so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about how you can be able to produce the enzyme by cloning the enzyme into a suitable vector. Followed by, we have also discussed about the different types of methods and approaches, how you can be able to verify the enzyme. And then we have also discussed how you can be able to perform the enzyme assays. And subsequent to that, in our the previous module, we have also discussed about how you can be able to utilize the enzyme assays to design the different types of inhibitors. And when we were discussing about the enzyme inhibitor approaches, we have discussed about the traditional approaches where you are actually going to screen the compounds and you may not need the structure of the enzyme or the inhibitor and uh, you will be able to get the uh, inhibitor to you know inhibit the enzyme and then we also discuss about the targeted approach where we have discussed about the ligand based approach receptor based approach or the uh, computer aided uh, inhibitor design so in if you have designed an inhibitor you would like to understand the mechanism of its action. You would like to understand how the enzyme is inhibiting the uh, protein enzyme and how you these inhibitors can, because once you know the mechanism of the enzyme inhibition, you can be able to work on that mechanism and you can be able to improve the activity of those, enzyme, uh, those inhibitors. So in this, today's lecture, we are going to discuss about the how you can be able to study the inhibition of the enzyme and how you can be able to do the different methods to understand whether the enzyme inhibition is uh, reversible or reversible and all other kind of aspects. So in this lecture, we are going to cover that particular aspect. So as you can say that the enzyme inhibition, so once you have developed the inhibitor, right, you have developed a inhibitor. Uh, it is actually uh, going to block the enzyme and that's how the enzyme will not be able to convert the substrate into the product, right? Now, this inhibitor could be of multiple types. So, what is the inhibitor? An uh, inhibitor is a chemical agent which is inhibiting or poisoning the enzyme, which means it is actually blocking the enzymes in such a way that your the enzyme will not be able to convert the substrate into the product. Uh, depending on the type of inhibitions, the enzyme, uh, the inhibition could be of irreversible inhibitions or the reversible inhibitions. Irreversible inhibition means it is going to be a permanent type of inhibition. Once you add the inhibitor, it is actually going to block the enzyme and then this is going to be a irreversible process. Whereas in the case of reversible inhibition, the enzyme inhibitor will actually going to inhibit the enzyme. But if you do some treatment or if you do some other method, it is actually going to, uh, you know, reduce or it is actually going to relieve the inhibitions. So the first question comes, how you will be able, so suppose you have designed an inhibitor, right? and uh, you have tested that onto the enzyme right so uh, suppose you have tested it on the enzyme and you will find that it is actually forming a complex with the enzyme and because of that the enzyme is unable so in when the enzyme is active it is getting converted the substrate into the product but when the enzyme is inhibited it is not being able to convert the substrate into the product right so it will not be able to convert the substrate into the product but this information is not complete until you know whether the inhibition or the inhibition is reversible or the irreversible so the first thing what you have to understand is whether the inhibition is reversible or the irreversible so how do you can actually be able to use the different types of methods to understand this so the enzyme, so inhibitor could be reversible or irreversible, right? Now, 
in a irreversible enzyme inhibitor the enzyme inhibitor is actually going to interact with the enzyme and that's how it is actually going to make a permanent complex which means it is going to be a permanently lock the enzyme into this particular conformation whereas in the case of reversible inhibition uh, what will happen is that you have an enzyme and when it is actually going to interact with the inhibitor and uh, you have an inhibitor when it is interact with the enzyme it is actually going to form the enzyme inhibition complex but that inhibit that complex is being mediated mostly by the non covalent interactions such as hydrogen bonding van der Waal forces and electrostatic interactions so this is reversible which means if you add for example if this is being mediated by the uh, salbit interactions you can actually be able to change the ph and if you change the ph this inhibitor is not going to be bind the in, in enzyme or even the inhibitor is bound to the enzyme it is actually going to be changed the other thing what you can also do is you can actually be able to do the other kinds of treatment and that's how the enzyme inhibitor complex can be broken down and that's how the enzyme can be reactivated its activity uh, so how there are many methods what you can actually be able to use to understand whether the inhibition is reversible or the irreversible first thing what you have to do is uh, first method is you can actually be able to do the dialysis okay so what you can do is and i'm sure you all know about dialysis right so uh, what we do is we take the enzyme okay and then you add the inhibitor okay and take this whole thing for example if i take the uh, 0.2 ml of enzyme and then if i add the 0.1 uh, ml of inhibitor okay and then you add the buffer right for example you add the buffer of 0.2 ml okay so this means this is the total 0.5 ml enzyme inhibitor mixture okay now what from this 0.5 ml what you can do is you can just take out the 50 microliter and you check whether the enzyme is active right that will confirm that the uh, inhibitor is working and inhibitor has inhibited the enzyme so it's not active right so that's why the enzyme is not uh, active right so in active or inactive right so if the enzyme is inactive you will know that the inhibitor is working now what you can do is just take this and put it into a dialysis bag okay so you put the dialysis clips and put it into a dialysis bag okay so you take this 0.5 ml and put it into dialysis bag right and put it into a beaker right with a lot of buffer right so you can put like uh, for example 2 liter buffer so what will happen is that when you put it into the 2 liter buffer uh, the if it is a if it is a reversible inhibition right because you have reduced because you have increased the volume the enzyme inhibitor complex is actually going to be get because you know that enzyme inhibition complex is having the equilibrium with enzyme and inhibitor right so if you increase the volume the equilibrium will go into this direction okay and because of that the enzyme uh, is actually going to be get dissociated from the inhibitor because the concentration of this complex is going to be lower down and as a result the it is actually will go into this direction and as soon as it will go into this direction the inhibitor will actually going to be uh, removed from the inhibitor uh, from the enzyme and when the inhibitor is going to be removed and inhibit since the inhibitor is of a small molecular weight mostly the inhibitors are in the range of uh, 500 Dalton, right? They will come out. So inhibitor will come out and will present in the outer environment. Okay, and because of that, the enzyme is, you are going to get the free enzyme. So enzyme will remain inside, and the inhibitor will come outside, and that's how the enzyme. And now what you can do is just after, for example, if you do this at for twelve hours, okay. And after that, what you can do is just take out the enzyme and ask the same question whether the enzyme is active or inactive. 
and if the enzyme is active okay then the the inhibition is reversible if the enzyme is still inactive okay if its enzyme is inactive then you will know that the inhibition is irreversible because the inhibitor enzyme complex is not being mediated by the reversible forces it is being mediated by the irreversible forces such as covalent bond and all those kind of things so in that cases the enzyme is not an emitter will not get going to be dissociated from the enzyme and that's how you can be able to know this so one method is dialysis you can actually be able to do dialysis the second which is still the same uh, similar method but it is more refined so what you can do is you can do the gel filtration And I'm sure still you remember when we were talking about the gel filtration chromatography that gel filtration chromatography is actually going to resolve the molecules based on the size. So what will happen is that you take the you again make a mixture of 0.5 ml and then you load this mixture onto a gel filtration chromatography. So what will happen is the, on the gel filtration uh, this 0.5 is actually going to be loaded onto a 25 ml of column. Okay. So, because you have loaded into a 25 ml column, the complex is again going to be get diluted and as a result, the enzyme inhibition complex is again going to be dissociated into the enzyme and inhibitor and as a result, what will happen is that inhibitor is going to be separated from the enzyme. So, what will happen is you will going to see the two peaks. You are going to see a peak which is for the enzyme and you will going to see another peak which is for the inhibitor. So, this is for the peak for the inhibitor, this is the peak for the enzyme when you run it on the gel filtration chromatography. So, now what you can do is just take this, this whole uh, peak, you can collect and you are going to get the enzyme and that you can actually again ask the same question whether the enzyme is active or whether it is inactive. If it is active, then the inhibition is reversible, right? Because you have removed the inhibitor and you can be able to remove the inhibitor. If it is inactive, then you can be able to say that the inhibition is irreversible because you still have the in, in, you, you have collected the enzyme fraction, but still the inhibitor is present. Because inhibitor is of a small molecular weight, so it will be get separated from the enzyme. So this is the two method what you can actually be able to use very nicely. The third method what you can do also is you can actually do the dilution method. So what the dilution method is? The dilution method will say, uh, I'll, I'll try here, okay. So dilution method. Now, what you can do is in the dilution method, uh, suppose an inhibitor is active at 1 micromolar concentration, okay. So, suppose the inhibitor is active at 1 micromolar, but it is not active, it is not active if you convert the enzyme, uh, if you change the concentration at 0 0.1 nanomolar, okay. This means if you do a uh, dilutions it will not going to be active. So, at this time it is active, the inhibitor is active which means it is actually going to inhibit the enzyme but this concentration it is not active because it is very very low when right? you will going to have. So, what you can do is you can just make the reaction mixture right this reaction mixture right and you keep the inhibitor at 1 micromolar okay. Now, you take the helicot of the enzyme and ask the question whether the enzyme is active or inactive. So, in this particular concentration, the enzyme is going to be active. Now, what you can do is you just take 1 microliter of this, okay, and put it into 1 ml of buffer. This means you have actually done the 1000 percent dilution, okay. So, when you do the 1000 times dilution, what will happen is the inhibitor is 1 micromolar here, the reaction mixture is actually going to have the 
inhibitor which is now in the 1 nanomolar right because you have diluted it by the thousand times now in this again you take the sum amount and you take the enzyme from here and you do the activity so if it is active then you will say that the inhibition is reversible if it is still inactive right if you got the enzyme which is inactive then you will say that it is a irreversible so dilution method is not confirmatory result okay because sometimes what happen is when you dilute the the, the buffers to uh, thousand folds or something the enzyme its quantity also is going to be reduced and in that case uh, uh, it's possible that the enzyme may not be very active so dilution method is being done once you have the confirmatory test from the dialysis as well as the gel filtration chromatography so dilution method is a quick method because it is just takes you know a lot a lot of time because uh, dialysis will take 12 hours gel gel filtration chromatography also will take some time but dilution method is going to just you have to set up the reactions take the one microliter put it into one ml mix it and then you take the small helicot and check whether the enzyme is active or inactive if the enzyme is active the inhibition is reversible if the enzyme is inactive then the, irreversible, the inhibition is irreversible. So, dilution method is a quick method, but it is having its own uh, drawback that sometimes when you do a 1000 times dilution or 100 times dilution, the enzyme concentration also will be very low and in, at that particular concentration, the you may not get a very good readable count. So, these are the um, some of the method, analytical method, what you can actually be able to use to study whether the type of inhibitions. Once you know the type of inhibitions, the type of inhibition could be reversible or the irreversible. So, we have the irreversible inhibitions where the enzyme is actually going to make a complex with an inhibitor and this complex is the uh, going to be mediated by the irreversible uh, forces such as covalent bond and uh, other kinds of interactions. So, this is not going to be get dissociated. Whereas, in the case of reversible inhibitions, the enzyme uh, is going to interact with the inhibition and it is actually going to be reversible. So, this, inhibition, this enzyme inhibition complex is going to be mediated by the uh, reversible forces such as salt bridge interactions it is going to be mediated by the electrostatic uh, interactions and uh, it is going to be mediated by the hydrogen bonding and so on so because these interactions can be broken down the inhibition can inhibitor can actually get broken down and give you the free enzyme and inhibitor again so in the reversible uh, category you have three different types of inhib inhibitions you can have the competitive inhibition you can have non competitive inhibition and you can have the uncompetitive inhibition so first we will going to discuss about the irreversible inhibitions and then we are going to discuss about the reversible inhibitions so irreversible inhibitor or irreversible inhibition as the name suggests it is actually going to be permanent and it is not going to be get affected whether you dilute the enzyme, whether you do gel filtration chromatography, whether you dialysis, some anything. Once you add the inhibitor, it is actually going to might make a complex with the uh, enzyme and that is how it is actually going to destroy the activity. So, irreversible inhibitor destroyed a functional group on the enzyme which is necessary for the catalytic activity. For example, diisopropyl fluorophosphate or DFP which inhibits acetylcholine esterase. Okay. The another example is idoacetamide. Idoacetamide inhibits the OH group of serine and SH group of cysteine and imidazole group of the imidazole group of the histidine. So, they are mostly the irreversible inhibitor are actually going to go and bind or destroy these functional groups onto the uh, enzyme and that is going to be irreversible damage and uh, that is how the enzyme will not be able to recover its activity even if the inhibitor is uh, present or not present at all. There are some examples of irreversible inhibition of the enzyme. For example, diisopropyl fluorophosphate DFP, which inhibits the acetylcholine esterase and serine proteases such as trypsin, chymotrypsin, and elastase. Then we have the British anti levicide, 
which is a antidote for the heavy metal toxicity. Then we have cyanide, right? You remember that the classical case of cyanide, that cyanide, nobody know the taste of cyanide because cyanide is very, very toxic poison, right? And why it is poison? Because it is actually having an irreversible inhibition of cytochrome oxidases. And cytochrome oxidase is a very important component of electron transport chain. So if the electron transport chain is going to be blocked by a molecule, it will actually stop the production of the ATP. So there will be a no production of ATP. And as soon as that there will be a no production of ATP, it is actually going to stop the physiological processes, right? And that's why the cyanide is going to be very, very, very potent, right? Uh, inhibitor, right? Because it's going to be irreversible and this because it cannot be, uh, you know, uh, allow the enzyme to be reactivated or something. That's why uh, any kind of poisoning or uh, toxicity by the cyanide cannot be reversed. Uh, then we have the fluoride. So fluoride actually inhibits the enolase and it removes the magnesium and manganese from the active side of the enzyme and that's how it is actually going to deprive the enzyme from the crucial uh, cofactors and because of that it is the enzyme will not be able to active so in a in a typical uh, reaction what will happen is that this is a reaction where, where I, we are actually discussing about how the enzyme is actually uh, how the uh, this dfp is actually uh, inhibiting right so uh, this is actually a diisopropyl fluorophosphate this is a dichlorophosphate and what you see here is this is the fluorine what is present onto this phosphate right and this is the dfp right and this is the enzyme enzyme which actually contains the active side uh, serine okay and it has a serine oh right so you see the, the lone pair of electron here which is present onto the oxygen of the serine so what happened is that when it interacts the fluorine is actually going to be removed right and uh, this fluorine is going to be removed because its fluorine is going to be attacked onto the lone pair of the oxygen and as a result the it is oh uh, o is actually going to make a complex with phosphate and now what you see here is that that lone pair is also gone and does not have the functionally active OH group, right? And this functionally active OH group is very important because once the OH is present, it actually can take up the electrons from the substrate. It actually can give the electrons to the substrate and that's how the functionality of the enzyme is solely being depend on to this particular functional group. So when you added the DFP, what the DFP will do is this fluorine is actually going to attack onto this particular oxygen and as a result it is actually going to make a permanent complex. See this is a covalent bond, right? So if it is making a covalent bond, whether you you dilute this enzyme, whether you dialyze this enzyme or whether you run it as a in the gel filtration, this bond is not going to be broken down and that's why this enzyme will no longer be functional. So this is actually going to be a non-functional enzyme because the inhibitor has blocked one of the uh, crucial amino acid and uh, this crucial amino acid could be present in the active site and that's how it is participating into the reaction. So this enzyme is functional enzyme, this function enzyme is a non-functional enzyme. So this is the more or less the classical activity or classical way in which the uh, irreversible inhibitors are actually inhibiting the enzyme. Now uh, irreversible inhibition of the acetylcholine esterase uh, by DFP, right? So DFP is a very potent inhibitor. So what uh, what will happen is that when it is actually going to you know inhibit the acetylcholine esterase, it is actually going to interfere into the uh, neural transport, and because of that, it is actually going to stop the communication between the muscle cell and as well as the neurons okay and as a result it is actually going to stop the activity of the muscle cell because you know that the muscle cells require the neural signal for the 
uh, and it's their actions, right? Uh, if you want to know more about the muscle action, what you can do is you can actually be able to go through with some of my course of which is called as the basics of biology where I have discussed about the muscular system and uh, we have, I have also discussed about the nervous system, okay? So how the esterocholinesterase and the neural transmission works, you can actually be able to go through with these lectures and they will actually going to give you the full idea. And once this is actually going to be blocked, the muscles will not actually going to be contract or relax in all those sense and that's how the person is no longer be able to move its uh, you know body okay uh, so this is what exactly going to happen the esterocholinesterase will have the functional a active uh, serine hydrox uh, serine and when dfp is going to be added it is actually going to make a complex and that's how it is actually going to produce the inactive enzyme and this inactive enzyme is actually going to block the uh, you know the transmission of the signal from the nerve cells to the muscle cell and that's how it is actually going to stop the muscle contractions and as well as and so the person is going to be get paralyzed uh, so cholinesterase this is exactly the same what we have shown that you are actually going to have the rvt 101 uh, uh, inhibitor and that also blocks another receptor which is called as the 5T, 5-HTX receptor which actually promotes the release of the choline and other neurotransmitters and once you are actually going to block this particular receptor it is actually going to stop the uh, you know secretion of the uh, neurotransmitters such as glutamate, estacholine and all that and because of that it is actually going to stop the neural transmission between the uh, two particular neurons and uh, same the other uh, drug which is called as uh, donipizil uh, and donipizil inhibits the choline stress preventing the breakdown of the estacholine and uh, how it is actually going to be act, uh, working because it is uh, because it's going to stop the neural transmissions it is actually going to increase the concentration of the estracholine and other neurotransmitters leading to the improved conditions so irreversible inhibition of the enzyme with the S, with the sh group so this is another example where the iodoacetamide can be used and iodoacetamide is going to block the enzyme which has the sh group which means it is going to block the enzyme where you have the functionally active cysteine so enzyme with sh group such as the cysteine when they are interacting with the iodoacetamide they are enzymes are getting the chemically modified and that's how the enzyme is getting converted into the inactive enzyme so what happens is that you have the enzyme for example uh, some enzyme which actually contains the active site cysteine right so it's going to have this right ch2 sh so this is the ch2 this is sh right and when you add the inhibitor inhibitor is going you are going to add the iodoacetamide so iodoacetamide is going to have the iodine and sh is also again going to have the electrons right so this iodine is actually going to attack onto these uh, sulfur groups right and as a result there will be a covalent bond which is going to be formed between the uh, sulfur and uh, this uh, carbon right and iodine is actually going to be removed right so hi is actually so this is going to be removed here right iodine is going to be removed and uh, hydrogen is also going to be removed from here right and then there will be a covalent bond once a covalent bond is formed this enzyme is going to be get converted into a inactive enzyme so these are the some of the examples where you are actually going to uh, you know chemically modify the enzyme then we have the another variation of the irreversible inhibition which is called as the suicide inhibitions so suicide inhibitions is as the name suggests here when you add the inhibitor the enzyme will actually going to go for the suicide which means it is actually going to enzyme it's actually going to process the inhibitor enzyme is actually so inhibitor is not irreversible inhibitor it is actually once it is going to be processed by the enzyme it is actually going to be get converted into the irreversible inhibition inhibitor, inhibitor and that's how the enzyme is actually responsible for converting 
uh, inhibitor into a societal inhibitor. So this is a specialized form of irreversible inhibition. Uh, it is also known as the mechanism based inactivations, right? Because here the enzyme is going to be actively participate into the inhibition mechanisms. Enzyme inhibitor makes use of the enzyme's own reaction mechanism to inactivate it. Inhibitor, which is a structural analog, is converted into a more effective inhibitor with the help of the enzyme to be inhibited. So, enzyme is literally committing suicide because they utilize the normal enzyme reaction mechanism to inactivate the enzyme. We will take the example, then you will understand how what, what it means actually. So, what it says is that enzyme is actually going to process the inhibitor and as a result, it is actually going to be get converted into, it is actually going to process the inhibitor. So, inhibitor is actually going to be go and bind to the enzyme and then it is going to be processed and that is how the enzyme is, inhibitor is going to get converted into an inhibitor star and then as soon as the inhibitor star is going to be formed, it is actually going to attack on the enzyme and that is how it is actually going to form a enzyme inhibitor star complex. This is actually a irreversible okay so this is actually going to be irreversible inhibition this means the enzyme is itself acting on the inhibitor and making it on its own death actually and that's why it is called as a society inhibition so what is the properties of the society inhibition it is going to be uh, irreversible inhibitions it is a very, very effective inhibitor compared to even the irreversible inhibition where you have the covalent bond. Uh, it is synthesized with the help of the enzymes, which means the enzyme is actually going to be get convert the inhibitor into a societal inhibitor. And then this in societal inhibitor is actually going to act onto the enzyme. Uh, examples are inhibition of xanthine oxidase by the allopurinol, which is a treatment of the gout. Then we have the alloxanthine synthesized by the xanthine oxidase using the allopurinol is more potent inhibitor of enzyme than the allopurinol. Then we have another example of arachidonic acid getting converted into a prostaglandin which is uh, going to be catalyzed by an enzyme which is called as cyclooxygenase and it is inhibited by the aspirin. Aspirin is an anti-inflammatory drug, right? And then we also have an example of 5-fluorouracil. So 5-fluorouracil is getting converted into 5-fluorodeoxyuridine and this 5-fluorodeoxyuridine is a more potent societal inhibitor because it is going to inhibit the thiodate synthesis and it is going to inhibit the nucleotide synthesis and it is being used in the cancer treatment. So 5-fluorouracil is an anti-cancer drug. So let us take an example of these some of these mechanisms. So first example is allopurinol. So allopurinol and allopurinol is a drug for the gout, right? Gout, you know that gout is a uh, disease of the joints, right? So the anti-gout drug is a societal irreversible inhibitor, mechanism-based inhibitor of the enzyme xanthine oxidase that works as the oxidase or the dehydrogenase. The enzyme commits suicide by initiating, activating allopurinol into a transition state analog, oxypurinol, that binds very tightly to the molybdenum sulfide complex at the active site. The molybdenum sulfide complex binds the substrate and transfer the electron required for the oxidation reaction. So what happens is that in a normal reactions, what is the xanthine oxidase is doing is it is processing the hypoxanthine to xanthine and then from xanthine, xanthine oxidase is getting converted into the uric acid and this uric acid is a, actually a problem because uric acid is a metabolic byproduct. Remember that when we were talking about the amino acid metabolism, we will say that there are so many uh, you know nitrogen derivatives and other things are going to be produced. So, you are going to produce uric acid, urea and all other kinds of derivatives. So, uric acid is actually going to be get deposited uh, into uh, into the joints, right? And that's how 
it is actually going to cause the disease which is called as gout and uh, uh, mostly uh, it is a you know, sometime it is a genetic disease and other kinds of things right so uh, now what happen is that when you have the allopurinol right so allopurinol is a inhibitor of xanthine oxidase but when the allopurinol is actually going to be processed by the xanthine oxidase it is actually going to be get converted into oxypurinol okay and oxypurinol is a very 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 potent inhibitor because it is actually going to bind the molybdenum sulfur center what is present inside the xanthine oxidase so initially the allopurinol does not have any activity or any kind of binding to the molybdenum sulfur center and that's why the allopurinol actually can will not be will not be able to inhibit the xanthine oxidase if the xanthine oxidase will not process the allopurinol to a oxypurinol so allopurinol is getting converted into oxypurinol and oxypurinol is actually uh, you know uh, attacking onto this molybdenum sulfur center and making a complex and once it's making a complex the molybdenum sulfur center is actually the active center which is involved into the electron transport or electron movement between from the enzyme to the substrate and because of that it will actually going to stop this in the this particular all these reaction which means it is actually going to stop the synthesis of the uric acid and as a as a result it is actually going to give you the treatment for the gout so this is what exactly happened allopurinol getting converted into the oxypurinol and oxypurinol it's actually going to have this nitrogen right and this nitrogen is actually going to interact with the molybdenum and sulfur center what is present onto the xanthine oxidase and that's how it is going to make the irreversible complexes and because it is made to make a irreversible complex molybdenum sulfur centers are no longer or molybdenum sulfide center will no longer be able to transfer the electron from the substrate to the other molecules and as a result they will not be able to catalyze these reactions then we have the mechanism of action of the 5 fluorouracils so 5 fluorouracil so 5 fluorouracil is getting converted into a fluorouridine and that is actually a suicide inhibitor so this is a carbon cycle this is the carbon uh, one carbon cycle right uh, through which the nucleotide and as well as the amino acid uh, components are actually exchanging the carbon pool between the so you will see that these are the uh, amino uh, protein carbon pool and this is the amino uh, the nucleotide carbon pool so when there is a shortage of carbon into the protein pool uh, the protein can actually take the carbon from the nucleotides when there will be a shortage of carbon in in the nucleotide pool then they, they will actually do the reverse and these are the some of the enzyme what actually going to function so you have the dihydrofolate reductase you have the thymidylate synthase and all other kinds of things right and at this place you also have another enzyme which is called as the shmt right so which actually going to convert the serine to glycine and that's how the uh, the carbon the ch3 is actually going to be transferred onto the tetrahydrofolate and form the n5 and 10 methylene tetrahydrofolate and then n5 and 10 methylene tetrahydrofolate which actually carries the carbon from the uh, serine is actually going to be taken up by the this uh, system and that's how it's actually going to form the dihydrofolate and then dihydrofolate is actually going to be converted into tetrahydrofolate and so on so thymidylate synthase is a very very active enzyme and it is responsible for the nucleic acid synthesis right because it is actually going to be involved into the synthesis of nucleotides and that's how it's actually going to be so if you thymidylate synthase when it processes the 5 fluorouracil it get converted into fluorodeoxyuridine and fluorodeoxyuridine is a suicidal inhibitor for the thymidylate synthase and that's how it is actually going to block the thymidylate synthase and that's how it is actually going to stop the reaction here this means there will be no exchange of carbon pool between the amino protein chain and as well as the nucleotide and as a result the nucleotide is synthesis is going to be stopped and that's how it is actually going to be uh, blocked.
the other enzyme which is dihydrofolate is actually going to be inhibited by the aminopterin and the methotrexate. These are the two other inhibitors, but these are not irreversible inhibitor. These are the drugs, right? Uh, Trifluorouracil, what people take for the cancer, right? So this is a cancer drug. So apart from the cancer, we have another example: the therapeutic usage of the enzyme inhibitors. You can have the uh, you know the clinical use for the epilepsy so where you are actually inhibiting the enzyme which is called as gamma uh, transmenase and the inhibitor is called as gamma vinyl GABA right then we have an, uh, the uh, dr drugs for the antidepressants which is called as MAO and the uh, the inhibitor is the triclopine uh, phenyl cell these are the two different types of inhibitors and then we have the anti-hypersensitive drugs which is estacolinesterase. Uh, the drug's name is uh, cabotrifil and the inaprolat. Then we have the cardiac disorders. So there are so many ATPases and then you also have the cardiac glycosidase. Uh, then we have a gout. So gout you enzyme is xanthine oxidase. The drug is allopurinol and then we have ulcers right so you can have many types of atpases because these atpases are involved in the uh, you know the proton uh, transport and all that so you can actually be able to use the omeprazole right and this is very popular right omeprazole pentaperazoles and all other kinds of uh, azole derivatives which you can use and these are the all are in, irreversible inhibitors for the this uh, in, uh, this class of enzymes now uh, Let's see, uh, uh, you know, the case study where we are actually going to study how you can be able to study a suicidal uh, inhibition kinetics and how you can be able to understand the different types of, uh, you know, the parameters and all that. So the case study is very simple, right, where we are actually going to in, in study about how you can be able to suicide inhibit, right. This is a societal inhibitor where we are actually trying to inhibit, uh, where we are trying to study uh, inhibitor which is called as NAC, okay. So NAC's full form is N-acetylcysteine, okay. And uh, it is actually being very extensively being used as a adjuvant uh, into the relieving the some of the, uh, you know, the damages during the malaria or it is also being used in the drug uh, in a, another disease which is called as the COPD okay so cong uh, cognitive pulmonary disease uh, so n is 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 you being used in adjuvant therapy it is a byproduct of glutathione it is a strong antioxidant it protects the cells from the oxidative stress it reduces the inflammation through the reduced secretion of the cytokine which is called tnf alpha and that thought to be protect the cell by increasing the gsh level inside the cell so what happened is that during the malaria you always have the rbc rupture right and when there is a rbc rupture the rbc is actually going to be released the hemoglobin and that hemoglobin is getting converted into methemoglobin so hemoglobin you know that hemoglobin is the oxygen carrier right and once that hemoglobin is getting present into the uh, oxygen environment it get oxidized so hemoglobin is actually containing the iron as iron 2 plus right whereas when the iron is present as iron 3 plus it is called as methemoglobin and because of this conversion the methemoglobin is very toxic right so it actually can cause a lot of toxicity issues right and that's what that happens during the malaria so methemoglobin actually can cause the oxidative stress into the cell and that's how it is actually going to be kill the cells right so since the NAC was uh, antioxidant molecule we thought that it may be blocking the methemoglobin molecule and that's how it may be reducing the oxidative stress and that's how it probably will be promoting the cell survival so ex uh, exploring this particular hypothesis we discovered that the NAC is a suicidal inhibitor uh, for methemoglobin now when we want to do this kind of study we have to actually take a lot of control experiments okay so for example we have taken the we have studied how the 
because you know methemoglobin is actually going to cause the RBC lysis okay which means it is actually going to so we first thing what we have measured is we had measured whether the RBC lysis is getting blocked or not so we did the NAC GSH methemoglobin methionine and NAM right NAM and NAC is having only one difference that instead of cysteine you have the methionine and you will see that when I remove the cysteine right it is actually not uh, protecting the cell from the hemolysis right so there is a hemolysis even methionine is also not been able to block but GSH is been able to block because GSH is doing the same function as the NAC right and then the same thing we have done also that we we have found that the because the methemoglobin has the peroxidase activity so it was actually blocking the peroxidase activity also the same way and then the hemolysis is also been blocked by dose dependently by the NAC so as you increase the NAC concentration the uh, hemolysis is going to be blocked same is true for the peroxidase activity so this is true that the um, NAC is actually protecting the cells from the hemolysis and NAC is also protecting the also inhibiting the peroxidase activity so then we also ask whether the inhibition is uh, reversible or irreversible so this is exactly what we have done and remember this is the experiment I have just said right so what we did is we took the math methemoglobin plus NAC you will see this is a hundred percent activity what you got right then we did the methemoglobin plus H2O2 it's hundred percent activity then we did the methemoglobin plus NAC plus H2O2 which means, means this is the complete reaction once you did the complete reaction the activity goes down to two percent right and then we took this hundred percent reaction we did the overnight dilution uh, dialysis and there is no recovery of enzyme this means by doing this we know that the inhibition is irreversible okay this means the NAC is a irreversible inhibitor of the methemoglobin paracetamol activity and then we tried uh, the other methods right so we tried like uh, protecting it by the substrates and other kinds of things to understand whether the substrate is actually going to protect so it's clear that if you don't allow the methemoglobin to process the NAC it is actually going to be get uh, blocked right this means uh, it is actually going to be a societal inhibitor so if it is a societal inhibitor we also did the societal kinetics so this is the societal kinetics. so NAC follows the mechanism based inactivation of methemoglobin so what you do is in the societal kinetics what you do is you take a reaction mixture and then you are actually going to take out the enzyme at different time intervals right like for example 0 0.04 0 0.08 0 0.12 and all that you allow the inhibitor to react for these many time points and you will see that the enzyme is fully active so 100 percent active then it is actually going to show you a reduction in change okay so these are the number of times minutes what you have actually kept and then you can actually be able to calculate the k ops and you can be able to uh, calculate the T inact. So, what is the minimum time required to in to inactivate the uh, in enzyme? Okay, and from this you will know that the Ki for this is uh, 0.76, and uh, the affinity of NAC for the uh, the enzyme is 8.5 micromolar, and T half inact, which means only 0.9 minute is required for inhibiting the 50% of the enzyme. Then we also did the uh, you know UV visible spectroscopy to know whether the NAC is being processed by the enzyme. So it's actually proce being processed by the enzyme, and that's how the NAC is going to be modified by the enzyme. And that's how this in modified NAC is actually going to be the culprit for responsible for the blockage. And that's why this was not happening when we were adding the substrate because if you add the substrate, then enzyme will process the substrate rather than inhibitor. So we identified what kind of modification, right? So what we did is we did an EPR experiment or electron paramagnetic resonance spectroscopy. And what you found is that there is a sulfur centered uh, free radical what is going to be produced when you are treating the NAC plus methemoglobin plus H2O2, 
okay that is not present when you are removing the hydrogen peroxide that is not present when you are removing nac or when you are adding uh, inactivated methemoglobin or when you are adding the methyl buffer alone so this was shown that this complete reaction is producing a uh, free you know producing the epr signal and that epr signal is uh, sorry uh, is actually saying that DAC is getting modified and this modi what is the modification modification is that it is actually forming the sulfur centered uh, radical okay which means some of the cysteine molecules probably have the sulfur where the you have the single electrons so once you have the single electron it is actually going to go and attack onto the uh, proteins uh, residues and that's how it is actually going to block some of the crucial residues uh, so NAC oxidation product is actually interacting with the sub enzyme. So if you add the H2O2, you are actually going to produce the NAC, uh, uh, you know, oxidation product, and that's how it is actually going to go and bind. Whereas if you don't have the hydrogen peroxide, it is actually not going to bind. Then what we did is we also identified the what kind of modification. So we found found is that the uh, N-acetyl cysteine is getting modified and this modified product is binding onto the protein and it is actually blocking the hemin. So, methemoglobin has the hemin and it is actually blocking the hemin part. So, hemin is, uh, NAC is forming an adduct with the enzyme bound hemin to inhibit the peroxidase activity. Then we tested this uh, NAC oxidation product uh, and uh, what we found is that when you add actually the spin trappers, so these are the uh, single electron trappers, okay. So if you add the NAC uh, along with the tempo or PBN, so these are the uh, spin trappers actually. So they will actually going to trap the single electron species, okay. So they are not antioxidant, they are single electron trappers, okay. So for so example, if you have a sulfur centered uh, single electron, they will go and bind. Okay, instead of this, allowing this inhibitor to go and bind to the enzyme. So, if you have the spin trappers, uh, you will see the hemolysis if the methemoglobin and NAC is present. But if the methemoglobin is NAC is present, you will see that if you add the these two, uh, there will be a inhibitor. So, if you have the methemoglobin, you are going to see a 100% hemolysis. When you have the NAC, you are not going to see the hemolysis. But when you have the activity in the presence of TEMPO or the PBN, you will going to see that the effect of NAC is actually getting reversed. So that actually proves that there is a NAC oxidation product which is responsible for the hemolysis. And ultimately we have come up with this particular model that NAC is actually having a, a SH group. So you know that the NAC has GSH, right? And when it is getting processed by the methemoglobin peroxidase activity with the help of the hydrogen peroxide, NAC is getting converted into the NAC sulfur centered radicals. And these sulfur centered radicals are in attacking onto the methemoglobin. And that's how it is actually forming the methemoglobin uh, iron sulfur clusters, right? And this is inactive. So this is actually a inactive enzyme and that's why it is actually not going to process. If you want to read more about this, you can actually be able to download this particular uh, paper from this particular uh, journal and uh, it will actually going to tell you the more details about this. So, so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the irreversible inhibitions and we have discussed also about the suicidal inhibitions. So, um, inhibitor when you develop the inhibitor inhibitor could be of reversible in nature or the irreversible in nature and within the irreversible nature you can actually have the societal enzymes or societal inhibitors or the mechanism based inhibitors or the non mechanism based inhibitor which means in a non mechanism based inhibitors the irreversible inhibitors the inhibitor will go and modify the active groups onto the active side whereas in the case of societal inhibitors the enzyme is actually going to process these inhibitors as such, as such like a substrate and then when it is actually converting the inhibitor into a modified form, that modified form is actually going to have the irreversible uh, act, uh, binding 
to the enzyme active site and that's how it is actually going to inhibit the enzyme. So with this, uh, we are going to conclude our lecture here. In our subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss about the reversible inhibitors and we are also going to talk about the enzyme inhibition kinetics. So with this, I would like to conclude my lecture. Thank you. Mm -hmm.